All right, so I'd like to introduce our speaker for the night. It's going to be Steve Gabriel. He is a specialty mushrooms and agroforestry specialist. Steve is an ecologist, an educator, and a forest farmer who has lived most of his life in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Steve's personal mission is to reconnect people of all ages with the natural world and to provide the tools for good management of forests and other landscapes. And he actually currently splits his time between the Cornell Small Farms Program and also running his own farm with his wife, Wellspring Forest Farm. And they're producing a number of different items, shiitake mushrooms, duck eggs, pastured lamb, nursery trees, and maple syrup. So uh, really, really a great speaker to kick this series off for us. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to transfer my screen over to Steve. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining the series here. Happy to be along. I've been, uh, we're just wrapping up our uh, online course, our six week class about uh, wood, woodlot or outdoor mushroom production. And we have another six week class starting um, next Tuesday on indoor production. And I'm gonna talk tonight about mushroom cultivation as a whole and some of the kind of general considerations and the ways that we could cultivate them potentially in those different environments and give you kind of an overview my contact info is here. I certainly am responsive, part-time basis running a project within the Cornell Small Farms Program on specialty mushroom production. This originated with uh, Professor Ken Mudge um, back in the 90s who was interested in agroforestry um, methods of mushroom production and tried a lot of different things, really settled on log-grown shiitake as a really viable uh, micro enterprise for a farm. And when I started working with him, I was doing research um, at one of Cornell's research forests on outdoor production. And when he retired, I joined his farms program, brought that mushroom information along with me, and we decided also to expand and really look at the wide range of mushroom production and the potentials for small farms. Uh, so in addition to outdoor systems, we're going to talk a little bit about indoor stuff tonight. And uh, it's not a one size fits all thing. So if you're interested, the great thing about mushrooms is you can kind of start from any place. You can try this, try that. You could do a lot of things in your kitchen or in a little backyard or in a little woodlot. And they're, they're pretty easy to grow um, to at least get that initial success. And then you might be interested in going deeper or more consistent production for yourself or for your friends and family. Um, that's certainly how I uh, progressed with mushrooms and then eventually deciding to to make it a business, make it a part of our farm. So we grow mushrooms both outdoors on logs um, as well as indoors in a controlled climate environment. So as far as the small farm program goes, uh, our home for all things mushroom um, would be uh, cornellmushrooms.org, that website. You'll find a lot of different resources there in print, in video. Um, we have a directory of suppliers, a lot of folks in getting into mushrooms often ask where they can get materials to cultivate mushrooms. So we have a supplier directory on the website. We also have a listserv for anyone interested in growing and talking about growing mushrooms. And, and so all these things you can uh, find and sign up for and, and check out on the cornermushroom.org website. So when we talk about uh, mushrooms, we're really talking about a <clears throat> much larger a subset, or I should say a smaller subset, a much larger group of organisms, which we would think of as the umbrella of king, kingdom fungi. And kingdom fungi uh, contains all the fruity mushrooms, a lot of fungi that um, form mycelial bodies, which is what mushrooms come from, uh, mycelium. But a lot of fungi form mycelial bodies, but they never fruit mushroom. And then there's a whole series of yeasts and molds that would all be part of kingdom fungi. So Estimated globally, um, somewhere in the millions, and but we've really only named a very small percentage of, um, of fungi in total and are finding all sorts of fascinating things about them uh, as these years go by in terms of ecological health, in terms of things like where carbon is cycled in the soil is actually um, more and more being thought to be in uh, the, the filaments of the mycorrhizae of, of beneficial mushrooms that partner with trees in forests, um, things like that. So lots of different ways. We're gonna focus on like this small, small group because if you walk um, in the woods in most of North America, you might come across one of 10,000 uh, fungi species that are actually fruiting, producing a fruiting body. And about half or at least the majority of those are 
are inedible or not that delicious. Uh, these numbers are, these percentages are not like, uh, you know, perfect. They're just kind of to give you some relative sense that, you know, most of these fruiting bodies uh, that we see out in the woods or uh, in our lawns or things like that in parks um, are, are not edible and, or you could eat them, but maybe only if you're trying to survive. Um, about 20% would actually make you sick. About four or 5% are actually delicious and amazing to eat, those choice edibles, and maybe 1% can kill you. So I, I just put these numbers up to give you a sense because uh, one thing is that often people are very afraid of wild fungi and um, and if you're not familiar with them, uh, it's certainly very dangerous to consume them until you can learn the proper ID. But like learning any language, um, it's something that you can learn and um, gather those skills from others and then and then work on that. But the nice thing about cultivating mushrooms is we kind of know what we're going to get and we can operate in a very safe zone. So there's actually more poisonous plants out, out in Mother Nature than there are poisonous mushrooms. But we often have this kind of fear because we don't understand them and we're not familiar with them. Um, because they're not something that's often part of our day-to-day -day or uh, something we were taught in school about or something like that. So, and, uh, and we're using USDA, so, uh, a mushroom in, a, in the commodity sense for USDA is the button mushroom species, um, Agaricus bisporus. Those would include your uh, white button mushrooms, your Carminis and your Portobellos. Those are really all the same species of mushroom. And they're over 90% of the mushrooms we're consuming in the U.S. right now. So just one species out of, you know, um, hundreds and hundreds that are choice edibles are, are actually being actively cultivated on a pretty large scale. And um, now those markets are pretty well established through much larger growers that, that are operating at that scale. And so we see prices in the, you know, 3 to, to $8 range for mushrooms coming from those systems. So we focus on specialty mushrooms because there's a growing demand, a growing curiosity, and a growing interest. And these mushrooms um, have you know, more particular environments they need to grow in. They're able to be grown at a small scale profitably. We see prices somewhere in the range of 8 to um, up to $20 a pound, depending on where you're selling them. So, um, so for small farms, this obviously has some benefit when we talk about the economics. We're not going to really compete with the large uh, mushroom growers, which are mostly focused on agaricus. And what we've seen over the last, um, really getting on a decade here, is, is uh, exponential growth in sales of specialty mushrooms. So there's a, a lot of opportunity, a lot of interest. Um, I've been overwhelmed uh, in my time at Cornell with just the, the buzz and the fascination and the kind of endless requests we get for educational materials, for workshops, for things like that. So there's a lot of interest there, and um, mushroom farmers tend to do pretty well if they get And so they, they provide good opportunities, whether you're interested in looking at that commercial aspect or just looking to grow mushrooms for yourself. So these are outdoor systems. If you go to our website, cornellmushrooms.org, and click on outdoor systems, you'll see a write-up about different ways to produce mushrooms outside. Um, this is a summary of the species we have experience with and would recommend you start with. Um, so working from left to right there, we have the species. You can see they all grow on different types of wood or different types of substrate, as we call it. And <laughs> they all have different methods that they prefer in order to do well. So we'll dig into a couple of these tonight, but you can check the website if you're interested in one of these species that we don't talk about or one of the methods. Um, all of that information is on the outdoor page of the website. And then for indoor, we get into a situation where rather than relying on the seasons and the temperatures and mother nature to control the conditions and get mushrooms, uh, we grow indoors because we can moderate those effects and get production on a more consistent, more uh, scalable and in some cases, um, you know, year-round type level. So we don't find mushrooms out in New York State um, for you know half the year. So from a uh, farmer perspective, sometimes it makes sense to to expand your your production season by going indoors as well. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. We'll talk about a couple tonight again. Some of the easier ones that are lower tech for the farm or small farm setting. So you can see some similar species here, some different ones that are really common to be grown on small uh, mushroom operations. And really, a lot of folks start with oyster as by far the easiest. So we'll talk a bit about more about that tonight. Um, there's some considerations around, you know, moderating temperature, uh, the types of foods. But you can see what we're usually doing is some kind of um, supplement in sawdust or wood pellet, like a, a high carbon um, substrate. Uh, with, with oyster, we can also use straw. And actually, chestnut, I'm learning now, you can also use on straw. Um, and, and then we maintain conditions during the incubation phase as those mushrooms are starting to grow through the material. And then we maintain different conditions when they're fruiting 
um, specifically changes in temperature and changes in humidity and light are what often cause these mushrooms to fruit. If we're going to grow them, we really have to understand um, how all these pieces fit together. And often people want to draw the analogy from mushrooms to plants, but um, in some ways we can think of it metaphorically, but certainly physiologically they're, they're quite different. Um, so rather than a seed, a mushroom uh, is, is really the fruiting body of, of the fungal mycelium, and that fruiting body produces spores. And so while a seed has a protective coat and it has a, you know, starches and carbohydrates, it has food, um, you could put a seed in your pocket and go halfway around the world and plant that seed. A spore is really just a, a sort of single cell wall thick. It's very sticky uh, and it has the information but it doesn't have any energy or food that's packing along with it. And so a mushroom's reproductive strategy is basically to send millions and millions out of these, out of the gills or out of the teeth or out of the pores that might be underneath the mushroom, send them into the world and, and hopefully they land in the right kind of food source and hopefully they find a mate because um, individual spores have to find compatibility out in the wild. Uh, so they can germinate and form hyphae, uh, these initial growth strands, and if they can find a mate, and we won't get into the complicated um, sex life of, of some fungi because some uh, fruiting mushrooms have thousands and thousands of different combinations and different sexes. So it's a very complicated process. Um, but if they find a mate, they can form uh, mycelium and start to really grow and establish themselves in, in that food source, in that substrate. And so for, you know, we will be organic matter like compost it could be straw it could be sawdust all these things work well um, at some point that uh, food is consumed through a first layer of um, consumption mycelium it's grown out and then it can actually form uh, primordia which is the pinning process that's when those little mushrooms are just coming out and then we have our mushroom so the mushroom is really the fruit and uh, the mycelium uh, the fungus is is actually in the substance but when you have mushrooms you're not damaged necessarily that um, organism actually. Um, so, so here's primordia. This is a shiitake mushroom um, fruiting out of the hardwood log. So this is this initial, initial pin, which um, for shiitake logs needs to be when the temperature is generally in the um, somewhere between the low, uh, well, high 50s to to high 70s are really the ideal window, but different strains and different species uh, fit within that window. So most of the productive shiitake that's grown to most of the growing season would be Somewhere in the 60, 65 to, to 75 degree range is really its ideal temperature. And then the, the natural humidity of the forest and all those kind of environmental characteristics are really nice for, for producing really beautiful, high quality shiitakes um, in this very natural setting. And the quality of them is, um, is far superior to those that are often found in stores. Um, but part of that is because if you're looking to bring these to market, you're bringing them to local markets and you're bringing them much fresher than they usually are. So, um, so really fun to play with. Really uh, where I got into mushroom cultivation is just a, a fun process to experience these in the woods. And we'll talk more about how to grow those in a bit here. Um, spores um, are an important part of the mushroom fruiting body if we're going to get into identification. So a whole other realm to get into if you're looking at identifying wild mushrooms and there's a long process to learn that well enough so that you could actually consume them. But um, in general, with a mushroom, it's important to know that a, a big identification, uh, a big part of identification is, is the spore prints. Um, and so with spore prints, you could take a fresh cap, you put it on a piece of aluminum foil or sometimes a dark piece of paper and a, a light piece of paper, and you just leave it there. And the spores will drop in, in both the pattern, actually you can look at them under a microscope, the shape of the spores, if you really get into ID, um, and the color, most importantly, for the novice sort of field identifier. Uh, is the way that you would figure out uh, what mushroom you might have. And, and that coupled with all the kind of visual uh, identification characteristics is how we do proper mushroom ID. So just some different ones there. And even as a cultivator, we're gonna assume, and, and we've never had a case where a fresh, freshly inoculated, actively producing shiitake log um, produces some other mushroom that looks similar to shiitake. Um, usually these mushrooms, Gallarina here, show up much later after the log's been through its productive life. and somebody tosses it in the woods and these mushrooms might show up at some point. And if we start to look visually, there's four or five different characteristics um, that we could start to tease apart to make sure these aren't the same mushroom. But ultimately we could also take a spore print and you can see drastically different spore prints from, from the Gallarina versus shiitake. So if you get into um, production, it's just sort of the, the disclaimer here that you wanna get into some ID and understand that process as well. Uh, but the good news, again, with cultivation, though, is we kind of get a, a ahead of the other 
potentially competitive fungi, the other fungi that might be in these substrates. And, um, and our, our first few flushes are, are sort of guaranteed to be these, these mushrooms, more or less, um, with a few exceptions. So the way uh, wild fungus was first domesticated was not from the, the spores, like we might grow plants from seeds, but similar to how we might take a cutting of a plant um, to get that genetic identity and, and then grow that out um, as, um, as a graft or something like that, or a seedling or a cutting, a hardwood cutting, softwood cutting. Um, in mushroom cultivation, what we're really doing is we're taking a fruiting body and taking a little piece of that fruiting body. We extract that in a sterile environment. You can see there on the Petri dish. That's grown out for a few weeks and then it's transferred to sterilized grain. And then it's transferred usually to more grain or sawdust or some mixture. And so um, suppliers, what they're doing is providing you with the service of taking those initial uh, master cultures and growing them out and giving them to you in a stable form that's very vigorous and, and willing to grow through material. So um, some of you may find yourselves into this process or getting into it as you grow, but uh, for a lot of growers, they uh, rely on the supplier for this and it takes a lot of the, the most challenging parts of mushroom cultivation out. You really just buy the fruiting, uh, the ready to fruit material, we call that spawn, and you inoculate things with that spawn and that really increases your chances of success. So we'll focus on two starting points for systems that I, I, I say in this slide are profitable, but if your interest isn't in, in that realm, um, we could say consistent or reliable uh, production systems where we can set up a schedule and actually get a consistent, relatively consistent flush of mushrooms every week of the season that we choose. In the case of log-grown shiitake, that season was is sort of in the window of what um, was appropriate outdoors. So most brooding happens between like June and October. Oysters on straw and sawdust, we can do them in more passive systems and kind of work with the seasons, um, the cooler seasons, if we're using a greenhouse or something like that. Or we can like fully create the environmental conditions and have them be, you know, fruiting year round. We just have to keep the space for growing them in, you know, hot or cool, depending on the, the time of year. So all grown shiitake is really nice in, in the sense it's very low tech. There's very little infrastructure required. Once we do the inoculation, we basically just need a tank and a source of water and we soak the logs and we can get some really consistent fruiting. And when I started out with shiitake, I was just doing, I was managing about 30 logs in my backyard. I'd soak about four every week and I'd have consistent mushrooms about a pound or so a week um, throughout the growing season. So very easy to do um, and get started with without a lot of investment or, or risk. So um, what I love about the log grown shiitake and outdoor is we can link the uh, management or the, the acquisition of the logs to, to a good plan for forest management. So often we're thinning out small diameter trees, like four to 10 inches in diameter is most common and um, and we can do that as part of a thinning that actually benefits the, the residual forest. Um, it's nice to have a system where we're using the woods and, and shady environments to produce the right conditions for mushrooms. We don't have to um, spend the time and energy associated with doing that indoors. Um, and shiitake is just a, a wonderful mushroom in and of itself. So it's very easy to use in lots of different types of dishes. It's very robust and I think that a lot of people that say, oh, I don't even know if I like mushrooms, it's a good starting point for them. Uh, to enjoy. Some of the, the, the cons when we compare outdoor production to indoor is you need, you need some space. Um, so often if you're really restricted in space, it may not be the best, but if you have a little bit of woods or a little shade in the backyard, that's all you really need to get started. Um, it's a little more labor intensive when you get into production systems that are um, thinking about labor efficiency because of the labor associated with moving logs, stacking them, soaking them, that sort of thing. And, and you do need water to soak those logs and that can be a challenge for some, some locations. So this is a mushroom that is not native to North America, um, but is um, um, uh, something that's been here since the 80s. It's really a, a benign, there's no real concern with any sort of you know, invasive or non-native tendencies we might be concerned with with other plants. It's a, it's a very slow growing mushroom, relatively speaking. There's no sense that it's actually naturalized out in the world. Um, and it, it does quite well. Um, so it's from uh, parts of Korea, China, and Japan is where shiitake originates. And this type of cultivation system has been going on for at least a thousand years. It might be one of the oldest things that humans have cultivated um, actively. So we do have some numbers from research if you wanna, uh, are interested in that. Generally speaking, what we find for shiitake is it's about uh, just, just a little under $5 in terms of time and materials, the cost to inoculate a bolt. And your return, whether you're selling those mushrooms or 
um, or consuming them yourself is you know about fifteen dollars um, per bolt over a three-year period. So what's nice is you inoculate these logs; they're in a productive state for about three seasons, and um, and you can get a, a decent return uh, from a, a pretty small operation. A thousand logs um, could generate between eight and ten thousand dollars over a six-month period. I mentioned the, the limits to the window of production, um, but there's plenty of operations that just operate within that window and do fine. Um, one of the big um, uh, questions around efficiency that we found from our research is um, that growers should carefully consider if they're thinking about um, an enterprise, uh, the cost of, of both inoculation and tree felling, because that's the, that's the majority of the cost in these enterprises um, as we go forward. So. Um, here's a picture from some traditional systems, um, you know, in Japan, and there's a wonderful video series uh, on these that's linked from our website. It shows some of the old, uh, these old methods that have been going for centuries. And of course, in Japan, they have much smaller little uh, forestry trucks, and they do their logs pretty long, about you know four feet long, um, and they cut them from uh, coppice woodlands. That they actually do mini clear cuts uh, that they've been generating sustainably. Uh, these, these products for, for several centuries. And um, and yeah, so they load them on the trucks and then they, they have the whole system of managing them. Um, generally, uh, our system looks a little different. We're not managing them from a clear cut or coppice situation. We're harvesting the trees from uh, thinning out uh, more mature woodlands. And we usually go for bolts that are, uh, or logs that are four to eight inches in diameter and about 36 to 40, that should say um, inches, not feet. <laughs> That'd be a little long, about three feet long. Uh, is what most people find comfortable to move around, but that's an important consideration if you're going to be moving logs around is whoever is going to be doing that work, they should feel comfortable with the size. And you can really cut them to any um, size or diameter you want, but do we find that this size is, is generally good for, for good um, for good production? So with shiitake, um, there's a lot of different species that grow on. Some of the most favorable the oak, sugar maple, if you were down in the southern region, you know, sweet gum would be good. But up north here, um, we have birch, uh, that's a good substrate. Uh, we have ironwoods, both the um, Australia, Virginiana, the hop hornbeam, as well as carpinus, the, the mussel wood or the blue beech, uh, are all good substrates to grow shiitake on. So if you have access to woods, chances are there's something out there that you can, you can grow it on pretty easily. There's three steps to inoculating uh, shiitake logs. We drill holes in the log um, with a, a, some type of tool. Um, a home uh, plug-in drill is perfectly fine. You, you do need something probably that plugs in because batteries will get pretty wasted when you're drilling 50 holes or so in each log with your with your battery drill. Most um, uh, small enterprises get into an angle grinder. You can actually buy an adapter and this is about 10 times faster than even a high-speed drill and it makes the work much easier on the body, much more efficient in terms of time. After you drill the holes and you can see you kind of drill, drill them in a diamond pattern where the holes are about four inches apart and then each row is about two inches from the next and you, you kind of space them out in this diamond pattern and really the idea is just to get the mycelium evenly spread roughly throughout the log it doesn't have to be perfect after that we would inoculate the log with the spawn itself so again that's mycelium that's been grown out on a grain or a sawdust um, substrate that's ready for you to inoculate the log and you can buy that in Several different forms, usually for logs, we're doing either sawdust or little wooden dowels that you hammer in. And then the third step is we wax over those holes to reseal the log and protect it from um, potential competition as, as that mycelium starts to grow from all those little points you drilled into the wood over the next roughly six months. Um, and, uh, and so in our climate in New York State, the way it kind of works is you inoculate your logs, they grow for when they grow, they go dormant once it hits winter, and then if they need to, they you know pick right back up in the spring. Um, what we like to you know while the spawn run is technically six months from when the from when you inoculate to when the mushrooms are ready to fruit, uh, it's good to, to to count on a year because of winter. So we try to inoculate our logs every you know April or May, gives them the majority of the growing season for them to the, to spawn out as we call it. So for that mycelium to run through the wood. And then uh, we know by the following spring, because when they're ready to freeze, essentially when they're going into dormancy, we know the following spring um, in May, sometimes early June, depending on how fast it warms up, uh, we know they're ready to produce. And once we know that, whether we're managing a small enterprise, like our farm does about 150 logs a week that we soak. Uh, I mentioned when I started uh, mushroom production, I did four logs a week. So it took me about 10 minutes to get a pound of mushrooms a week. You can't really go wrong 
with that um, in your backyard. So, um, so soaking them means soaking them in water for 24 hours. And we don't exactly know why, but that does stimulate them to fruit. This is why we can get reliable, consistent production. Most of the other outdoor methods, all of the other outdoor methods actually, you can look at the resources for on our website. Um, essentially, uh, they fruit when they want to. Um, you can't control them, you can't have any consistency. But the beauty of the, the shiitake log is you can soak them and have that consistent flush week after week. So of course you can use a natural body water um, or a tank or something like that, and that's a consideration. So generally speaking, in the growing season, again, you know, June-ish to October-ish, uh, we have reliable production window in New York State. And um, um, this is what the logs look like about a week after you pull them out of the tank. So they'll generally uh, fruit on average between a quarter pound and a half pound of mushrooms per log per flush. And you can see some of the older logs um, would maybe produce a little less, some of the newer logs a little bit more. So that's an average that we found over the the time that we've conducted research um, here at Cornell. And so we can build a budget off that. We can have some assumptions. We need to pay attention to the grow, growth of these shiitakes and mushrooms in general and, and really aim to harvest them at the, the right time. So there's a, ri there's a ripeness window. And you can see the primordia there on the left. So that's too young. Uh, we have our nice uh, mature middle ground in the top right there. And then we have what I like to call the pancake mushroom where it's gone a little um, south because uh, what we want is the cap to be slightly curled and to maintain that really nice dark color. That's the things we're looking for. And that's basically translates to freshness and taste and also to longevity. So we can store these in the fridge for sometimes as long as a week and they still look pretty good um, if we harvest them at the right time. But if we go too late, they usually become a bit yellow or brown pretty quickly in the fridge. After we soak an individual log uh, or a group of logs, we need to let those logs rest before we can try to soak them again. So they're not gonna, the same log is not gonna produce week after week. What we're really doing in these systems is rotating a group of logs and then letting other logs rest. So our research found that six to eight weeks is generally the window. So we operate on a assumption that we, we work on a seven week rotation um, on the farm. And um, so you can think if you had seven logs, if you had 70 or 700 or 7,000 logs, it doesn't matter. You just divide the number of logs you have into seven groups. And on the first week of June, you soak your first group. And then uh, second week, you soak number two. Third week, you soak number three and so forth until you get to group seven. And then you know group number one has, um, has gone through its rest cycle and is ready to go again. So on our farm, we just keep our you know 150 log groups in seven separate piles. And we label them with scrap wood that we've, you know, spray painted numbers on to keep track of things. It's pretty simple. Um, if you had just a few logs, you know, you could just lean one up against uh, seven different trees and, and kind of work from there. So very easy to do and keep track of and, and have some nice consistent mushrooms. So happy to take questions about that um, uh, as we go. Um, and uh, also at the end if we want, but I'm gonna transition right now to- uh, So Steve, we do have one question so far. Oh on the shiitake. Um, okay. How exactly is the spawn put into the log? That's from Molly. Um, sure, so let me go back if I can. Do, 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 do. Um, so for sawdust, there's this little inoculation tool. It's basically like a little plunger that you kind of uh, stab into the bag, fill up the plunger, and then you plunge it into the hole. And if you buy the wooden dowels, really you're just taking them out of the package and nailing, the, uh, hammering them in, excuse me, with a hammer. Um, so that's, that's, that's really the two methods that are the most common. It's pretty easy to do. The main difference is the dowels cost a bit more. So they're nice because you don't have to buy the inoculation tool. Um, they're good for, for small producers or homeowners. When you start to scale up, it's a little more cost effective to buy the, the sawdust spawn. Um, and so that's why we go with it. And, Debatable on which one's faster, nailing the, or hammering them in versus uh, versus the tool. So yeah, thanks for that question. And uh, all right, let's go into some oysters. So this is going to be a little bit of a sort of quote-unquote indoor type system. Although this picture on the left is when I grew oyster mushrooms on coffee grounds in my kitchen. So, you know, don't think you have to necessarily have an indoor production facility in order to grow these mushrooms. They're very fast growing, they're very tolerant. There's a lot of fun things you can do with oyster mushrooms. They're really the, the place to start. Um, and so you could do this anywhere from a kitchen to an old, you know, uh, part of your high tunnel at the right time of the year, 
to um, to a window in your house. I mean, there's all, the bathroom is sometimes a place people grow mushrooms. There's all sorts of different places. Um, of course, if people are getting to commercial production, they usually have some dedicated space that's easy to clean and easy to maintain the optimal environment for these mushrooms. But it, they're worth playing with. Um, so what I like about the indoor system with, with, with oysters in particular is we can grow in, in small and maybe we could call them reclaimed spaces. So maybe some shed that's being neglected or the basement or the garage or someplace that's not being utilized can be used to, to start farming another uh, high value product in a very small space. Um, the, when we compare growing oysters on sawdust or straw versus on uh, shiitake and logs, one of the benefits is we get a very quick spawn run and very quick turnaround from inoculation to fruiting. So it can be as little as three or four weeks before these materials are ready. Um, you know, the downside of that is they're only going to produce uh, for, for maybe up to two months and then they're compost. So the benefit of the shiitake, you have to wait a bit, but you have that long lifespan of the productive life of the log. Oyster systems tend to get in a much quicker cycling um, of the material and sort of uh, mushrooms coming in and, th and, and spawn going out. Um, for a homesteader, for a gardener, for a farmer, one of the interesting things though is that the, the spent material from the mushrooms is actually really valuable in and of itself. So it's a great compost substrate, it's a great soil amendment. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with it. It's even been used as animal bedding and animal feed if you start to dig into the research. Um, an oyster, what's great is you can really use any materials. There's, there's so many different things you can grow oyster on from logs and wood chips down to straw and sawdust and fuel wood pellets and all sorts of different things. The cons is that to some degree, if we want, you know, the more consistent quality and quantity we want, we have to up our infrastructure to monitor and regulate temperature, humidity. We start thinking about oxygen and carbon dioxide when we have them in indoor spaces um, at any sort of productive scale. So these are things you have to learn and, and they're easy to learn. There's a lot of um, great resources out there to help you learn those, things, but you are, it's a little different than just stick a bunch of logs and have that experience. Um, so you can have problems and just like a, if you're familiar with indoor production of any sort, high tunnels, greenhouses, uh, hydroponics, things like that. In those contained spaces, you can always have these outbreaks or these problems that will show up because you're not sort of an open environment. Although of course, outdoors, you can have problems as well. Um, and so those are the main pros and cons. Um, what's fun about the oysters, there's just lots of different uh, colors. These colors um, are fun. Uh, it's fun to have pink foods, we have blue foods and gray foods and uh, brown and yellow and all sorts of different colors. Um, uh, these mushrooms are, oyster mushrooms are one of the most ubiquitous of all fruiting mushrooms around the world. They're on all continents that have sort of, um, you know, uh, terrestrial life, uh, plant life, uh, you'll find oyster mushrooms. And so the pink ones, for instance, come from more tropical regions of the world. The blue ones or the gray ones come from more temperate or cool climate ones. And so depending on your growing environment, you can actually leverage and utilize these different strains, these different types of oysters to, to match the growing season or the conditions or the products you want. Um, so some numbers, these, these are more estimated. We're currently doing research actively at Cornell to look at different production methods and get some uh, more database numbers. But we have some projections based on our work with other growers and, and so just some kind of really basic ones. We have some budget tools on our website. I mean, if you, want to, if you want to dig in, you can dig in for sure. But just to kind of summarize for you all tonight, um, generally speaking for like a straw bale's worth of material, um, we might have a cost of $120 and we get a return of, of somewhere between 20 and 40 pounds of mushrooms. So a return of 200 to 400 gross. So if you say that that's a gross, then your profit um, really depends on a lot of different factors, uh, of course, in there. Um, and so a 50 pound per week operation would, would, would grow somewhere between 12 and 14K over, over a six month period. So um, if you're interested in the kind of the, the commercial end of this, um, often folks, if they want to scale, they, they start thinking about these types of systems because the returns are um, a bit more good in that sense. Um, you have to invest in the infrastructure and the materials and all that stuff. Um, uh, same with the logs, inoculation uh, and substrate treatment. So we add a different thing when we inoculate logs or, or outdoor materials, we don't usually have to treat them. We'll talk about that for one example here, but you do have to clean the material before you inoculate or else you're going to have a lot of contamination problems. Um, but you know, some, some other things we can produce year round. And like I said, the spent substrates have a really uh, high value in terms of soil uh, health and fertility. So we'll go through oysters on straw in particular, because this is one of the easy ones to get started with. Just know there's different recipes and different methods. So what we do is we, <coughs> uh, we pick a substrate, we pick a, a food for the mushroom that we want to work with. 
could be because it's what's available, it's what's cheap, or it's what's reliable. Um, we treat it by either pasteurizing or sterilizing or, or some other methods that we'll talk about. We introduce the spawn, we give it conditions so it has a really rapid spawn run and that it is um, at risk for contamination or other issues. And then we provide good breeding conditions. So generally speaking, a higher humidity um, and, and more light to the mushrooms or the mycelium. So very common uh, materials that the growers are working with are shredded straw and sawdust. That would be a high carbon. And then oftentimes trying to supplement with something higher in nitrogen. So often uh, the byproducts of a lot of agricultural production like um, <coughs> cotton or rice or soy hulls are used or even coffee grounds can be used in these, in these production systems. For low tech methods, um, so if we had straw in particular, we can use one of these different methods. And again, these things are outlined in more detail on the website. But we're basically, um, you know, treating the material and knocking out the competition and giving the oyster uh, a leg up because all these treatments will, will sort of knock out the competition, but the oysters can tolerate these things. So most common would be to heat it or raise the pH with a hydrated lime. Um, and so there's some kind of numbers there. And again, you'd want to dig into the descriptions on our website if you want to learn about these. You can also just literally sit the straw in water and let it ferment and go anaerobic. And actually that can be a, an effective treatment for production. Um, but it is called the stinky straw method for a reason. <laughs> so not a long-term uh, strategy for most folks, but it is a low, the lowest tech method out there. Um, uh, then there's kind of high tech methods where you fully sterilize, whether you're steaming the material in like a barrel. This is a barrel called Bubba's Barrel that a, a brewery company makes for mushroom producers. And they're, they're, they're cleaning the material in that barrel and then inoculating it. Um, and then there's also uh, uh, sterilizing under pressure, which has the advantage of being much shorter in duration, but also you have to invest in that equipment. Um, on a home scale, a pressure canner can work well. Uh, often at a farm scale, we're looking at something like an autoclave or something, which, which can be pretty pricey. Um, so we, we bring the substrate to a, a certain temperature. Um, in the case of uh, pressurized, we would just bring it to 200 Fahrenheit or 15 PSI for just a couple hours with kind of just steaming it or cooking it. Sometimes it can take longer. Um, one really common way at a low tech is in the kind of backyard way, uh, but this can be a very way to do this profitably as well as you take a steel drum, put a turkey fryer with some propane, uh, a uh, propane hookup underneath, and you cook the straw in the barrel. You generally heat it up to about 180 degrees, and then you turn off the, the propane, and you put a lid on it, and you let it sit for a couple hours, and that maintains a hot enough temperature that you clean your material. And then you basically drain it and inoculate it. And so here's a little you know, backyard setup where we have a, a barrel, we have a nice uh, a winch here to, to help lift that straw, and a nice little uh, container to help facilitate that. They have a little table there on some saw horses that they're gonna, it's a clean surface that they're gonna lay the straw and inoculate. Um, here's a, this is actually a, a cool monastery down in South Carolina that uh, one of the ways they, they support their, their uh, work is through mushroom cultivation. And you can see here the monk is uh, cooling this material down, uh, spreading it out, and then he's sprinkling the substrate, um, the, the spawn, I should say, uh, the mycelium that's coming from the, the production company in there to inoculate that material and then they'll get packed into containers and it'll be brought into the, the room to, to grow. So with growing and fruiting, the more you want to get consistent, the more you want to get reliable with your production, you start to have to have a, a little bit of differentiation in the spaces for what we call incubation, which is the first two to four weeks versus fruiting. And you can see some of the differences here. So for instance, on our farm, we might have two separate rooms. Um, we have a small production uh, house that's about 16 by 20 feet. And we can produce you know, around 100 pounds of mushrooms if it's maxed out. Um, this is an, uh, actually a new thing for us on our farm. But for years, we grew in a high tunnel. I think I have a picture coming up. But we maintain these different spaces um, so that we have you know, um, success in our production. So yeah, here's the high tunnel. We just uh, used part of our high tunnel. We had a, a separation here. Uh, some walls we framed up. We put plastic in the different rooms. So the incubation room is, is kept cool, uh, dry, and, and dark. Uh, and then the fruiting room is, is more light, but not like bright light. Mushrooms just need a little bit of light to develop pigment. So um, maybe just enough to make out the outline of your hand is a good, you know, low light, um, high humidity and, and stable temperature. So, you know, you create these on, on, on cheap. You can do pretty well with them um, with, with not much. Here's an example from another farm where we have an old refrigerated truck 
uh, that was turned into a, a fruiting room. So you can see here the blocks. These are sawdust blocks that are inoculated and they're put on these racks um, and, and then kept at a certain temperature. They have some lights in there. They have LED rope lights in there, which is a nice light for mushroom production. Um, they have misters running from the ceiling there to maintain the humidity and things like that. So you can do these in a lot of different types of spaces and a lot of different kind of combinations. Here's a, a sh shipping container in New York City where they framed and built out a room where they were doing inoculation and fruiting of mushrooms. So, you know, lots of potential to think about repurposing spaces and, and getting involved with that. So here's a method that we did for several years. Uh, we either um, treated that straw in a 55 gallon steel drum in, uh, with heat or with lime. We kind of mixed it. We went back and forth a bit um, over the years. And then we uh, cleaned up, um, we cleaned out these bar buckets. We got a, a, a really good, hook up to some buckets from a, a friend of ours who worked in a lab and, and they were using a five gallon bucket of hydrogen peroxide like every day to clean the lab. So we got these really clean buckets. Uh, we would scrub them out, wash them out, and then we'd inoculate, we'd treat our straw, we'd inoculate it, and then we'd stuff it in the buckets. And we had really good uh, production in here for several years. Uh, long story short, I'll just say our, you know, over time the high tunnel that we were going in with the gravel floor um, started to present some contamination problems. It's too hard to clean the space. And so um, because we were trying to scale up and have that reliability, we uh, started to have a, a more reliable space in terms of cleanliness and, and productivity. So um, so you can, you know, on a homesteader scale, on a home scale, you can get a lot of successful fruiting. It may not always be reliable and you may go through cycles of contamination. And that was what I experienced when I was growing them in my kitchen, you know, uh, years ago. Um, so you sometimes have to reset, you have to try something different. There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, if you're thinking about a commercial venture, then often you want to really create a space that you know, has a washable floor, washable walls, and is something that you can maintain cleanliness because that'll really, uh, in the end, maintain your, your productive um, system. Uh, here's an old dairy barn in South Carolina. Uh, this is uh, Trad Cotter, who's of Mushroom Mountain, which is a, a wealth of good information about mushroom production. Um, and he has a book called um, Organic Mar Excuse Me Organic Mushroom Farming and Micro Remediation. And again, his name's Trad Cotter, a uh, good friend of mine. Really wonderful book that introduces you to both indoor and outdoor methods uh, for growing mushrooms. Another uh, more recent book that came out that I'd recommend as well for beginners would be a book called DIY Mushroom Cultivation, um, and that's by Willoughby Aravello. Or Veo. I'm not sure how to say his name exactly, but I can look for the links when we end here and, and post them in the chat for you. So a couple of good resources there, but this is interesting because there's an old uh, dairy barn uh, farmer, uh, young son, didn't want to maintain the business. And so, um, uh, you know, look, was, was the you know, dairy industry has become hard and so was looking for something else to do. So repurpose some of the area to growing these oyster bags. These are long logs of straw. So he'd inoculate them, he'd hang them on these chains and then be able to move them easily from an incubation room to a fruiting room. And so you can see there's lots of ways to adapt the growing system for different rooms, different habitats, so to speak. And um, so it can be a way to revalue or reclaim some of those buildings that might be sitting around on the farm or the, the land, um, as it were. So. If you want to uh, dig into oyster mushroom cultivation, this is a really great beginner guide. Fungi Ally is a, is a provider of spawn and materials and a lot of education. We are currently partnering with them on a project to work with um, indoor mushroom growers and collect some data across the Northeast. Um, so their website's a, a great resource and we've co-authored and they also have a, a number of these kind of booklets. So there's one about um, oyster mushroom cultivation you can find there. Um, that's really good. And a couple others that we've worked on recently. So that's another great resource. And that is it for my um, prepared slides. So I'm happy to uh, take some time to answer questions if there's anything about specifics or um, any of the methods we talked about, other ideas or other experiences people have had. I'm happy to hang around for a little bit. Um, while you all think about that and enter any questions in the chat, I'm gonna also look for those books and just give you a link right in the chat. So if you wanna look them up, you can do that easily. All right, well, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, we do have one question so far in the chat. And again, I encourage everyone to, to keep sending in your questions. But um, Kelly had asked, what do you use to clean your tools that you're using uh, when you're getting your oysters ready to go? 
Yeah, so for oysters, we, you know, if we're using a pitchfork to move straw, that's, we just use that pitchfork for moving straw for oysters. We don't also use it to muck out the horse stall. And so we have a you know, separate set of tools that we keep clean. Anything that's coming in contact with the substrate or the spawn or anything like that, we you know, wash our hands. Maybe sometimes we wear gloves or a really common um, way to keep things clean is using a bottle of isopropyl alcohol that's watered down. You can kind of spray on things uh, at a low dosage and, and kind of keep things clean. So, you know, surfaces, tools, all these things um, um, should be kept relatively clean. And the nice thing about oysters on straws, you can do your inoculation outside. Um, you can, you know, keep your tools kind of in your situation sort of relatively clean. As you get into some of the other uh, mushroom species and some of the other methods, then you often have to kind of increase your um, sterility and increase your process. But the straw is much more forgiving and, um, yeah, as long as you keep things generally clean, you're, you're good to go. Well, I'll ask a follow-up on that. You had mentioned in your high tunnel with the, the stone there, that was pretty hard to keep kind of clean and, and sanitized. Have you changed to a, a different system there, or how are you growing your oysters now? Yeah, so one option that um, some farms do is you can, um, if you're looking to sell, is you can actually buy in um, ready-to-fruit blocks. And... We were in transition last year from that space to what we've done now. And um, in that time uh, produced, so we'd, we'd buy in the blocks from a, a supplier again, and then we'd fruit them and sell them the mushrooms. And so that high tunnel space was really adequate for that. It was just that we ran into a lot of contamination problems in the first stage where the mycelium is most vulnerable to contamination. And mainly just where we had the greenhouse things, it, was, it got a little hot. It was hard to maintain cool enough temperatures for them. So. So for us, and re revisiting our goals and deciding about our scale, you know, we ended up um, putting more uh, investment into a building that we can essentially heat and cool much more efficiently, and that's really what it comes down to. And, and again, something we can clean well. So, so yeah, we're 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 in transition because because of the scale we're achieving for. And 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 again, it's really interesting to see kind of the range of creative solutions people come up with for these spaces and and how they make decisions over time to you know, keep them or or move on to something else. So. Okay, great, thanks. So again, uh, if anyone has any extra questions, uh, please go ahead and type those in. Um, and Steve, I think I'm just gonna go back to sharing my screen uh, just to show people what our next couple of talks are gonna be on, if that's all right. Yeah, uh, sounds good. All right, so hopefully everybody can see my screen again. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And again, if you have any extra questions, feel free to type those in. Um, I just wanted to follow up and just give you guys an idea of where we're heading. So again, this is part of a, a series. So next week, we're going to be looking at the basics of nut production. Then following that, we'll be talking about adding poultry to farms. And then I'm going to be presenting the next week, talking about the basics of tree fruit. And then we'll wrap things up with food safety for the small farm. Uh, so, you know, if you've signed up for, for just one or, or two, Maybe there's a couple more here that you might be interested in. And we'll see, it looks like there's a few more questions coming in. Can you sustain one colony by continuously replacing the wood pellets? Um, to, to a point, so what happens with that, um, my, that spawn that you're buying is it's a young, sort of vigorous life stage of the mycelium. And so often what happens is over time as you feed it to one thing, you might be able to feed it to the next. Uh, that's more on a home or hobby scale. You can certainly transfer mycelium. Um, some things are easier than others. For instance, the, the wine cap, which was briefly mentioned, um, is a mushroom that grows out well, outdoors in wood chips. And once you have a fruiting, you can actually take those wood chips and inoculate new beds outdoors pretty easily. But again, the um, consistency of those fruitings is, is much more up to mother nature than, than what you can do. So perfectly great to, to do that and experiment with that. That's easier when you get into um, something like uh, wood pellets, you often are sterilizing them. And what we find is that the mycelium does not uh, do so well in the next generation, the next generation. So we're generally starting over with new, um, new fresh mycelium that's kind of that has that vigor in it. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Um, so again, Unless anyone has any other questions, I think we'll go ahead and end it. I'd just like to thank Steve again for teaching us about mushrooms tonight.
And Steve, if anybody does have any questions that come up later, is it all right if we give them your email so you can follow up with them? Yep, I'll put it in the chat for folks. All right, perfect, thank you. Thank you. So again, anybody can follow up with Steve at sfg53 at cornell.edu. And otherwise, I think we're gonna end it here. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And hopefully we'll see you at some of our later ones.